The Holga is probably one of my favorite cameras ever produced, and there was some sad news in the last couple weeks, some of you may have heard, that the company that makes these in China has announced that they are no longer going to produce Holgas. In fact, it went a step further to say that they've already shut down the manufacturing facility, sold off all the machining equipment, and whatever is left in stock on shelves in the stores now are the last of the Holgas. And this news made me a little bit sad because there are, I mean, the Holga's gotten a little bit of a bad rap with people over the years, but it really is one of my favorite cameras. It is nothing but limitations, but once you get a handle on those limitations, not only is it an excellent way for a beginner to learn how to take pictures and how photography works, but it also creates a set of challenges that you need to get around creatively to make it do what you want it to do. And so that's what we're going to talk about today with the Holga. If you've never seen one of these up close, the Holga is basically a cheap plastic camera. It takes 120 medium format film and features pretty much no frills. You advance the film manually. Um, it has one shutter speed. The early Holgas only had one aperture setting and you have a single element meniscus lens that's made out of plastic and so because of the inconsistencies in the production uh, different cameras look different ways. You can focus it. There's a couple little icons here on the lens barrel that you can use for that but that's about it. In fact there's no reflex system in here so without a mirror the viewfinder and the actual lens don't even really sync up most of the time and so the best way to learn how to shoot on a Holga is to run a lot of film through it and to really learn the camera and learn how the framing is going to work. Learn what that shutter speed is going to be because the shutter speed can even vary camera to camera depending on how old it is. Um, and so there's a lot to kind of grok as far as learning how to use a Holga. But in my opinion, those limitations, once you get around those and you understand what you can and can't do with the camera, that opens up a whole window of creativity, I think, in terms of what you can push it to do. And I think that's what makes the Holga so special. Now, the Holga has had a bad reputation here and there over the years. And I think this is largely due to some misconceptions about the camera. And that's what I want to talk about. And one of the most commonly ones you hear is using a Holga or any kind of plastic camera camera is a great way to get an arty look to your images. And I know what is meant by this. It does have, you know, the, the single element plastic lens, which does vary camera to camera, and it does have a really specific look to it. But I think to just say that it's a great way to make your images look artistic is as silly as thinking that Instagram filters are going to rescue a bad image. A bad photograph is a bad photograph no matter what it was taken on, and pushing yourself to make better photographs is what the Holga is all about. And I think that that, that misconception, I think people are kind of wrong sometimes about why you would want to shoot on a Holga. Yes, it, I guess it does have an artistic look to it, but that's not what you're shooting a Holga for, and that's not what you're trying to achieve necessarily by using a Holga. Another thing that you will hear people say about the Holga is that it is an overpriced hipster camera, and a lot of this reputation is thanks to Lomography.com, who started distributing Holgas, I suppose, in the early 2000s. And in the U.S., you would go into places like Urban Outfitters, and you'd see them all on the shelf and they'd have price tags you know for this camera of $65, $75 US and they featured redesigned packaging and often they would come with a book and the book was filled with images that were shot from the hip not really even thought about composition or anything but they were featuring things like light leaks and color shifts and uh, cross processing and things like that and you know I think on the one hand yes Lomography still to this day does sell a lifestyle and that's where that hipster reputation comes in with the product that they choose to sell. At the same time, though, I think that Lomography does deserve some credit because what they did in the early 2000s when the photography world was moving to digital is they introduced and made cool film photography to a younger generation of photographers that probably would have just passed up film in general. And I think they do deserve credit for that. I think most people who get into a camera via Lomography and get serious about it quickly realize that there's a lot more to it than just lifestyle photography. But Lomography Lomography does deserve some credit on that level. Now, having said that, I was buying a lot of Holgas. In fact, I own way too many of them, which you'll see in a second. But I was buying them at the same time in the early 2000s, and I would get mine off of eBay. And you could find them used, or you could find them from Chinese dealers. And depending on whether they were new or used, you could get them anywhere between $10 and $20. So it was a really cool way to you know, try different cameras out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, because of the inconsistency with the lens design, each one of them has a little bit different look. I've got some that are very 
very soft that give the classic Holga look, and then I have some that are very sharp, and they're both fun to use in their own way. And it's a way that if you are really challenging yourself with this type of photography, you do have some more options at your disposal. The last misconception I want to talk about is you will hear people often say that the Holga is a really cheap and easy way to get into medium format photography. And that, most people understand, is a misconception because yes, the Holga does take 120 film and you are going to have medium format negatives in the end. And at the same time though, that's a really big blanket statement. And if you want to get into medium format photography, what is it that you're trying to achieve with that? And I think most people, you know, if you look at the history of camera design, um, oftentimes the early Kodak brownies and a lot of the box cameras used medium format, one, because it was a little bit more the standard than 35 millimeter, which was a little bit later, but also because they would use the big negative because of the low resolution of the lens. And so if you think of trying to get into medium photography as getting into a Mamiya camera or a Hasselblad or something like that, the Holga is a different ball game and it's not going to be be that. It's not going to be about resolution and sharpness and larger negative. It's going to be about what it is. And it's the Holga is just not about sharpness. It's about embracing photography and understanding the imperfections and the limitations and how you move away from there. So you might be wondering now why I am saying the Holga is one of my favorite cameras ever produced. And I think there's several reasons why. Um, the big one for me is that the Holga does have a lot of personality. And a lot of that personality comes in that you have to learn how to use the camera. And it's a little bit tricky. You have an immense number of limitations on this. You have one shutter speed. The early Holgas only had one aperture setting. The later Holgas only had two and then what you can do with the lens. You have to manually advance the film. You do have a flash hot shoe on here that does work. And there was a model of Holga actually that had a built-in flash as well. And then those are the start, the limitations that you start to work with and you realize what can I change? Um, what can I control about the camera? So for instance, if you're shooting in low light, you could use the camera in low light. What you have to do is use a higher speed film and you have to consider the possibilities of maybe even pushing your film to get the images that you want. If you're gonna shoot in bright daylight, you're gonna use a lower speed film. You're going to have to change your film when you go back and forth. It's not, you don't have any of the, the ease of using a digital camera with these. Um, what happens when you focus the lens? What can you do with that? And so I think that for a beginner, the Holga is a wonderful way to learn photography and to learn what makes an exposure. And there is a little bit of trial and error involved. I think for me, I found inconsistencies in the shutter speed. So for instance, if you have an older camera, it's a little more worn down. It's just a spring in here when you take it apart. Uh, a newer camera will be snappier and maybe a little bit faster. And so you need to go shoot some rolls and experiment and figure out what's working within the camera. So there's a lot of trial and error involved. So I think for beginners, it makes a lot of sense because you're gonna learn a lot about photography and using this or any kind of box camera or toy camera or what have you. And I I think that also for people who have been shooting for a while, um, and her maybe more advanced, one of the reasons that I like to do it is it still pushes me creatively to do different things. It's not an exciting camera to pick up and shoot. The viewfinder is totally wonky. You're not even sure what the framing is going to do matched up, but you're going to start to exhaust possibilities real quick and start to push yourself to be more creative. Like for instance, I remember especially in the, like the early days of Flickr, there was a lot of interest in plastic, crappy digital, cam or sorry, film cameras. And one of the techniques that you'd see people do a lot was they would actually, and this one didn't even have a tripod mount on it, but you could mount a Holga to some kind of tripod. And if you advance the film, and I have it taped up here because I was having light leaks, but there's a red window back here and you use the back of the roll film that will tell you what frame you're on for the exposure. And so if you've just shot frame one, you will roll it up and you will get to frame two. And once that's showing, you'll shoot that. What's cool about the Holga is like one of the most amazing double exposure and multiple exposure cameras that you can do. If you forget to wind accidentally, you come up with a happy accident sometimes. And then you think, okay, well, how can I use double exposures to intentionally get an image? Um, one of the things that the people were doing on Flickr back in those days was doing panoramas where you figured out that exactly 32 clicks, because this is clicky, you would click that and exactly 32 of these go by, you would count them, and then that was the edge of the frame. And so you would shoot there. And so what you could do is just move the camera slightly with each shot and you would end up with one long panoramic image. And I remember one time I was doing this and I went the wrong way when I was doing my panoramic image. And it was a nice happy accident because what I got was certain parts of the image that would repeat in certain places. And so it opened up something creatively for me. So. You know, the Holga is really interesting because of those limitations 
situations that you're trying to get over and some of the mistakes you'll make on the camera, it really is pretty easy to shoot on once you learn what you're doing and once you start to get a feel for it. And this allows you to do some new things, um, to start to push the camera, start to try to you know get outside that box and do something different. And I would actually argue that the Holga is one of the most creative tools in that regard. So I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the Holga. Now this is a very early camera. This is an Ansco B2 Cadet, which I also love. But this is what's commonly referred to as a box camera. They take medium format film, no frills, one shutter speed, one aperture, all you do is point and shoot. And this one has two viewfinders on it that have mirrors in them and so they reflect through the finding lens on the front. So whether you want to shoot landscape orientation, you look down into this one, or if you want to move it to portrait orientation, you use this one. And these cameras were very common in the early days of photography when you get into the age of Kodak, and where Kodak and Ansco and a lot of these companies were bringing film photography to the consumer level. And so, you know, Kodak back in those days had the slogan, you push the button, we do the rest. And so the whole idea was you could load the camera with film, you push the button, and then you send it off to the drugstore or whatever, and they would do your processing and prints for you. And if you look at a lot of images from that time, a lot of them are grossly overexposed in broad daylight, or they're underexposed or don't come out at all in the negatives, and we all have family photos that go back to that era. But it was a significant leap because it brought photography down to the consumer level. And these companies had long careers and histories and made a lot of money doing that. And they literally brought photography to the consumer level. Now, if you jump forward to the 1960s, there was a company, and this is kind of hard to find the definitive answers on how the Diana camera came around. But the Diana is a lot like the Holga. It's a cheap plastic camera. It has a very unique look to it as well. It takes medium format film, but actually the negatives are much smaller. You do get square images, but they don't use the full negative. And the Diana are very cool to work with too. Um, the Diana, the what the best I could find as far as information goes is there was a company that was producing these very cheaply, and it was essentially a toy camera that they were using for uh, you know conferences or if you had a company and you wanted to give away gifts and you could have them customized. So the Diana was the main camera. These were very cheap to buy and they would just be given away. This one uh, is branded with the name Arrow on the top, and this one is a banner, and I also have a Windsor in there, and there were many variants on this, and they all have a different look to them. The Arrow is extremely interesting. This camera shoots nothing in focus, but it has a cool look to it, and it's interesting to try to make photography using this, and that's one of the reasons that I think the Diana camera, um, you know, I think later had a resurgence uh, by the time you got to the 1970s and 1980s is that people wanted to photograph with these. I believe the Holga, and don't quote me on this because I might not be right, but the 80s, I want to say, is when the Holga first came along. And the original Holgas um, had some design defects to them. There actually is an aperture switch. This is one of the early ones. This is the 120S. When you throw the aperture between cloudy and sunny and you look in there, you see a washer move over, but there's another washer in front of it, so it doesn't actually change the aperture. So it was weird design oversights like that that made the camera kind of funky. So people who thought that I'm adjusting this for a cloudy day, there was no difference at all. It was still shooting at the same aperture as it was in broad daylight. So um, the Holga came along and you know, because it was made of plastic, a little bit more solid construction than the Diana, and these were actually produced and sold as these junk plastic toy cameras. And what's interesting is around also in the early 2000s, a gentleman who's a friend of mine named Randy Smith started modifying these. And he would do things like putting tripod sockets on them. He would take the lenses off and make pinhole cameras out of some of them. Um, he actually re-engineered the lens um, that would handle close focusing, for instance. And I can't remember how far away the stock camera actually shoots, but if you want to do, it wasn't quite macro, but you could get it up to two feet. And Randy would put modifications in for those. And he started selling these under a company that he had called Holga Mods. And they're still around now, um, holgamods.com. And he's moved into doing some other cameras as well. And of course, now that the stock has dried up on Holgas, they're going to be harder to get. But over the years, it was really interesting to see what Randy did. And after he made some modifications, Holga started making some of the modifications in their cameras as well. Um, not quite as many. They weren't flocking the interior. And let me tell you what that is too. Flocking the interior is this. If you take the back off, I'll show you here. So it's made out of plastic and it's kind of shiny on the back. And so this can add some glare to your photos and some fogging of the film sometimes if light gets in there or depending on what you're shooting. And so Randy would use a non-reflective paint across the back and he would flock the interiors. And 
I have several cameras that Randy built and they're some of my favorites. He would do things like add a bulb switch for long exposures and a release cable. So all you had to do is get this on a tripod and you could do nighttime exposures with the whole gun. I had a lot of fun shooting at night um, with long exposure. And it's another element that you can add to the Holga. He also did things like add waste viewfinders sometimes. Um, there's a TLR Holga. He would put them on Hasselblad bodies. Randy does all these crazy things. I highly recommend you go check out Randy's work. It is very fun. Um, he does some great things. He's a really nice guy. And uh, I've bought stuff from him over the years and he does some really cool things. But what's interesting is when he started modifying them, Holga came out with the 120N, which actually started using a lot of Randy's modifications. We have the tripod socket now under the lens. Um, there were several other variants on these two. They had one with a color flash in it, for instance. Um, they had, this one is one of my favorites, which is a stereo Holga, which is the craziest thing ever. And this, there's kind of several ways you can use this camera. It has dual flashes and dual lenses, and you can shoot on medium format film. And the idea is that it comes with a stereo viewer and stereo inserts as well. So you can actually view stereo images, which this is a throwback to early photography as well. And I love the stereo camera. The other thing you can do is use this as two separate cameras. So you use the lens cap, you cover one, and it's one shutter for both lenses. So you would cover that lens, you'd shoot one picture, then you could go on, cover the other lens, get another exposure, then for the whole film. So there's all kinds of wacky things that you can do with these, especially with multiple exposures or with trying to do panoramas and layering and things like that. And so this one was a really cool camera as well. And you know, that's kind of the variations to where we are today with the standard Holga from the 120S to the 120N, which is the last one produced. I wanna take a second and give a shout out to our sponsor and share with you something amazingly cool. As most of you know, audible.com has been a sponsor of our show for quite a while now, and they have just released Sally Mann's book, Hold Still, a memoir with photographs, which has just come out, but this is the audio version. And what's really cool about this is it's Sally Mann narrating. It's unabridged and it is awesome. So you get the whole thing here. Um, Sally Mann is a brilliant photographer and most of you will be delighted to know that she is a pretty darn good writer as well. And to hear her narrate this, I had an opportunity last week uh, here in Fort Worth. I went to go hear her speak at the Modern and she spoke and read a chapter out of, out of this book, which is the chapter on Cy Twombly and it is amazing and it is fantastic and just absolutely fascinating. It's a set of memoirs and so she started researching her own family history and found quite a bit of wild stuff to talk about and it's absolutely entertaining and there's some pretty amazing stuff in here. A lot of the themes in the book, much like her photography, deal with the American South, they deal with racism, they deal with mortality and so there's a dark element to it but it's extremely interesting and very entertaining and I think this is one of the cases where the audiobook is just as important as the hard copy physical book. And audible.com have a deal right now for art of photography viewers where you can try their service for 30 days absolutely free. I would take advantage of this folks and go check them out and go download and listen to the Sally Mann book. It's absolutely free for the first 30 days. If you're not familiar with audible.com, they are a bookstore for your ears. They have over 180,000 downloadable titles of books from every type of genre that you can imagine from fiction and nonfiction to periodicals to you name it. And it's a growing collection that they're working on nonstop. And it's a great way to keep up with reading, particularly when you're commuting, driving, uh, doing housework, times when you can't read, but you would rather listen to a book. And I think when they have stuff like you have the right narrator, particularly when it's the author, uh, the audiobook has a very different quality to it than the, the hardbound book. And I think they're really worth checking out. So if you want to take advantage of the free 30 day trial, what you want to do is go to a special link. You want to go to audiblepodcast.com slash AOP. That is audiblepodcast.com slash AOP. That lets them know I sent you. And and you can get the 30-day free trial. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks once again to the folks at Audible for once again sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. So the height of my Holga obsessive strangeness came about uh, probably about six years ago, and some of you will probably remember this. At the time, I was doing this show, but I was also doing an audio podcast called The Photography Show that I did with my friend Wade Griffith, who's an excellent photographer. And we were doing an episode one day, and I'll, I'll link up to all this stuff in the show description. It's all still up if you wanted to hear it. But um, we were doing a show one day, and we were talking about how a lot of photographers have the tendency, I mean, it's human nature, we all feel like like if we had better equipment, we'd be a better photographer. And we were talking about how that's largely a myth and becoming a better photographer is getting out and learning how to shoot. And I mentioned in the show, I said, you know, I even think with the Holga and the Holga has a very specific look to it with the soft focus lens. And there's a Holga kind of vibe that comes off of it. But I said, even with the Holga, if you had four really good photographers and you gave them each the same camera, um, you would have four completely different styles, different looks, different approaches. And, you know, on a plastic camera, 
camera that cost $20. And I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons I really love the Holgan. I was saying this on the show. And so I also kind of said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will even put a challenge out there. If anybody wants to shoot on a Holga, let's do an experiment. And this experiment turned into something that I called Holga Projects. And I have a lot of these on the website still. In fact, I have all of them still on the website. And so what I did is I bought a bunch of Holgas. I had people donate Holgas, and they had a fleet of about 30 Holgas at the time. And what I did is I sent these around the world. In fact, there's an interactive map on there so you can see where each of the countries where the Holgas were sent. And basically, um, I made it a little complicated, but a Holga will have 12 exposures on any roll of film. And so what I did is I said we had 12 exposures. I put a roll of film in here and I sent it to the first person. And we had uh, three photographers that had four pictures each that they could take on the camera. And so the first photographer would take four pictures. They would mail the camera to the second person, the third person. They would send it back to me. I would develop the film, scan them, and put them on the website. And this was, it was funny is this is a project that I'm not sure I would attempt today because it was so complicated of each person having to only take four images and send it along. And a lot of times what would happen is people would say, oh my gosh, I have the camera. They got to be the most four amazing images I've ever taken. So they'd sit on the camera for a few weeks. But Oddly enough, I got every camera back in the mail. In fact, some of these cameras went around the world several times. Uh, sometimes people would decorate them and put stickers on them and stuff like that. And it was a lot of fun. I only lost two cameras in this whole process. And what's funny is, ironically, they were both lost in Texas. <laughs> it was very close to home because I live in Dallas. And so um, anyway, I thought it was very interesting. But it, it was really cool to see what different people did with the cameras and the approach they would take. Sometimes we'd use color film. Sometimes we'd use black and white film. And the results were amazing. And we never really finished the project. It never had an end to it. It would be cool to do it again one day, perhaps, or find a way to do a book or something as a result. Uh, but the results that we have that we did up to that point, I mean, it was a tremendous amount of work to try to track. I had to get uh, signed releases that I could use people's photos on the website. I had to uh, ship the cameras. We had to pay for shipping. Anyway, it was, it was expensive and not easy to do, but it was a lot of fun, and that's what Holga projects were. At the start of the show, I mentioned that Holgas are no longer being produced, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means, and it's funny when you see photography news sometimes because, you know, you have a mixture of people who comment on things, and to some, it's like, oh, great, I never liked Holgas anyway. I'm glad they're gone, and others, it's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's no more Holgas, but to be honest, folks, there are a ton of Holgas out there. In fact, there are any variation on the Holga that you want to try and get. Like this box camera that I mentioned earlier, this is a $5 camera. You can find these in thrift stores. You can find them on eBay. You can find them uh, lots of places. And it's the same principle as the Holga. It's a little bit different size and a little bit different shape, but it's a single lens. It is a single shutter speed, a single aperture. And this is what you're going to want to do is work within those limitations to see what you can do to get better as a photographer. For instance, these cameras, uh, because of their age, um, you know, in the early days, slower film was not produced at higher speeds so you know 400 almost didn't exist at one point so a lot of people shot on 25 ISO film or 50 ISO film and so the shutter speed was slower to accommodate that and combine that with the fact that they're getting old now and the shutter slows down a little more so what can you do to get around that you can use a slower film you can use filters uh, you might use a red filter to knock this back a stop and control the contrast you might use an orange filter or if that's not enough you could combine that with a neutral density filter or a circulized or circularized, circular polarizer. Anyway, but those limitations are what you're going to learn how to modify to work within those restrictions to open up the creativity, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, I, you know, there's no excuse like Holga going out of business. Well, you can find anything else. I mean, Diana cameras have not been made in years, but they're still around, all the clones. Dianas are collectible, so they do fall prey to expensive pricing sometimes. But I'll show you another one. This is one called the Dra and D-R-U-H, I believe it's a Czech camera, and it's made out of Bakelite, and it's kind of a heavy plastic. And this one's the same principle as a Holga. This one's got this funky lens that you unscrew, and your shutter speed, or sorry, not your shutter, yeah, you have bulb or timed exposure, and then you also have your two apertures, 16 or 8, uh, on your f-stop. So it's the same thing. Now, this one doesn't have the clicky wheel, so you're going to be able to experiment some different things doing double exposures, and maybe it's more organic. But, you know, for me, I think, and I shoot a lot of digital. Digital. Um, but for me, that's one thing that I think is missing from the digital world is some of that ingenuity and willingness to experiment with things that is so easy to do with film. And I think that people who are very much film photographers are more willing to experiment with some of those things, particularly the toy camera and the plastic camera crowd. So anyway, all is not lost. There 
plenty of cameras out there and I do encourage you if you've never shot on a Holga to find an inexpensive way to get into it and, and learn and experiment and see what creative possibilities open up. If you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to like it and share it with your friends and as always subscribe to The Art of Photography for more videos. We are doing a ton these days. I've had to take a short break. Um, as you can see, we have a new studio in here and I've had to kind of like stop doing videos to get this finished. Um, I will give you a studio tour in the next week or so when I get it totally wrapped up. But uh, painted walls, built a camera shelf back there and we'll do some tours with that coming up. And uh, I'm glad to be back making videos again. It feels good. So anyway, once again, guys, that's about all I got for today. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.